and then you have your third one, this right here. You're not doing anything. You're just supervising, right? So there you go. That is what they are doing. And so when you see somebody in a Mason uniform, I didn't give that away. I just let you guys decide, okay? Okay? Anyway, but... You're not, you're not talking about the Freemasons. Yeah, Freemason. I was 20 years I was Freemason. I was the, the youngest master of a blue lodge in the history of the Grand Lodge of Japan. Okay, I was 19 when I was the master. Of, maybe I was 20. I came in at 19, which is the youngest you could be. And I became the master of a blue lodge, the youngest in the history of the Grand Lodge of Japan. Okay, and then I became a 32nd degree Mason and a Shriner. I did all of this stuff. I can tell you right now, they're not here to take over the world. Don't read that crazy stuff on the internet. They're a fraternity. That's all they are, okay? People get so bent out of shape over this kind of stuff. Uh, one guy, he posted on Facebook last week. He's kind of nutty anyway, but anyway, he posted on there, you know, the, the Gnostic World Order, Mason, Freemason, blah, 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 and all this stupid stuff. And he had this long commentary. No idea what he was talking about. And I simply posted down there, you know, I was in the Blue Lodge in Japan. I was a master of a Blue Lodge. I was also a 32nd degree, a Scottish Rite Mason, and a Shriner. And I said, what you're saying here is not correct. Well, guess what? The next day, my post was removed. I went back to check because there no comments after it. So guess what I did? <laughs> Defriend. You know, I don't need that. People that are going to spread false things you, just to be sensational and have more friends think that you're a great whatever, insane. Anyway, it's a fraternity, all right? And just because some people in that fraternity use that as their personal religion doesn't mean that that was the goal of it. The goal of it is to be a fraternity. That's it. Okay, so just so you're aware of that. I mean, the Catholics have got the Knights of Columbus, and they have the Moose Lodge and the Deer Lodge. People just want to have fraternities, and they all stem from the fact that people want to do their own thing away from other people. That's pretty much it. So, anyway, um, uh, that is what... To answer your question, it took five minutes to answer that, but they are the bearers of burden. And so theirs would have been up like this, okay? They're, they're the burden bearers. And then you have, obviously, skilled people. And we're going to see this again in the book of um, uh, Kings, I believe, when Solomon builds the temple. Okay, you've got, um, it's a matter of fact, seeing how you brought it up, let's go there real quickly, because we nev may never get to Kings. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Who knows what's going to happen in the future. Uh, hopefully the Lord will be back this afternoon and we won't have to worry about this at all. But it says um, uh, 13 years to build his own house. Okay, okay, here it is. We're in 1 Kings chapter 5 um, and we're going to go to, um, uh, we'll start with verse 13. Then King Solomon raised up a labor force out of all Israel and the labor force was 30,000 men. And he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month in ships. Shifts, they were one month in Lebanon and two months at home. Adoranum was in charge of the labor force. Solomon had 70,000 who carried burdens and 80,000 who quarried stone in the mountains. Besides 3,300 from the chiefs of Solomon's deputies who supervised the work, the people who labored in the work. So here we have 70,000 who are carrying the burdens. You've got 80,000 that would have their thing up because they're down there working, cutting in the quarries. And then you have 3,300, which are overseeing all of them, which comes out to, what, 153,000 people that he had doing this work, plus the people that were working up in Lebanon, 30,000, 10,000 a month. So he had a lot of people doing all of this work, okay? But that's another example of the exact same thing, the building of the temple. Who are you going to use? You've got common laborers, you've got middle-level laborers, and you've got master laborers, and these are the supervisors. So people already know what's going on, and they're coordinating, just like we do on a road crew today. You've got seven guys standing on shovels, and you've got one over here telling them they're doing a good job, right? That's how it goes. So, and you know, they, you get a call at the, uh, the uh, main office, and they say, listen, Tom, we need more shovels out on this job. And they said, why do you need more shovels? You must be doing a really great job. And he says, no, we got three more people that need something to stand on. So, uh, I, you know, and it's funny, but it's true. You go to these sites and there'll be a whole group of them standing around there on their shovels. So, and, you know, it's not always that way. They pay very good. The, the better the shovel standard, the more pay. That's right. Okay, so I hope that was a little bit of fun based on uh, that particular verse. So go ahead, uh, next one is what? Verse uh, 6, set 5. And Pharaoh said, Behold, people of the land are now many, and there is no room for us to go up. 
You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. Now imagine this. They already have a quota. They've become a slave labor force, as we learned earlier. They have a quota. It would be like us saying, you know, you have to lay... Um, uh, I was in wastewater treatment for years and years, 15, 20 years. And, you know, if the guys are out in the field, they are going to demand that they dig, you know, 400 feet a day or something. And you have to do it. They provide the shovels. And, you know, you go through a shovel once every four days because they don't last. I mean, you think shovels are going to last. We use them once in a while and they last 20 years. Shovels don't last long. So all of a sudden you say, now you have to provide your own shovels. And the guys are only making nothing anyway. they got 17 children at home. Just think of the burden. I mean, equate it with their own day. Whatever the job is, or you are in uh, an office and you have to print off um, 300 things a day. And now they say, well, we're not going to give you a printer anymore. You've got to go do your own printer and your own paper. This is a giant. This isn't some small thing. This is a major thing because they have a quota and now they have to take the time to find something. You know, do you know what straw in the brick is for? Does anybody not know? It's a binder. It's a binder. It's just like we put into uh, concrete, we put rebar in there. Now, when I tore up part of the uh, walkway at our house, uh, the one that I live in now, we have this one walkway that went all the way from the, uh, the mailbox all the way down to the bay. It's about 400 feet long or 250 feet long. And... Um, I tore up from the mailbox up to the first house. And when I did, they had taken, to bind it together, shark hooks. You know, this was a fishing village out on Siesta Key for, forever. That was either drug runners or, or fishermen was all that lived out there. So they had taken shark hooks and they had just strung them together. So I have all these shark hooks that I beat out of the concrete and I got them around the house, you know. Big, giant things. I, huge. I mean... Boy, would that hurt, but that's how they bound it together. This is the same thing. They, they take straw and they put it in there and it keeps it from crumbling apart, okay? Uh, nowadays we can use, um, uh, you see in concrete little stones and the different sizes of the stones will mean it will bind differently. Too big of a stone, it'll break this way. And then when you go down uh, you, you know, a, a sidewalk, they cut it every three or four feet. That's because if it cracks, it won't crack all the way. It'll just stop it where they've cut it. So it's a real science. I mean, doing masonry work seems like it's low-level stuff, but it takes somebody with knowledge to make sure that you don't have errors. Remember when they put in the first uh, sidewalk on Siesta Key, the very first one. We, she demanded for years a sidewalk on the key. And so what did they do? They laid an asphalt sidewalk from the bridge down to Sanderling Road, about a mile and a half where nobody ever went. It was just, you know. And what did they do? They put it about this thick right above Australian pine roots. And that thing, I mean, yeah, you know, I, I was young and I was told to stay on that thing and I was just like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you'd beat yourself to death on this. It was probably more dangerous than being on the road, which there were three people that lived down there back then. So, I mean, it was like, you wouldn't see anybody. You could walk from my house to 7-Eleven and see two people, maybe, you know. But I stayed on that stupid thing for years. <laughs> Uh, the, Calvin, the old Cattleman Road. Oh, wasn't that horrible? Does, who here else remembers Cattleman Road? We got a couple. Before it was paved, it was just a little... That was how you induced labor in your wife if she was running. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You could drive a, a car down into those potholes. She'd take us out there about once a year to see the cows. And, oh, wow, look at that. You know, it's like being out in the jungle, you know, this old Cattleman Road. And then... She'd take us downtown whenever, about 17th or 17th Street to get your upholstery done. About once a year, we'd have to go out there. You know, nobody ever went up to that part of town. Just fun memories. You know, Sarasota has really changed. It's all six lanes and all paved. And uh, anyway, here we are back to the Bible. Okay, wherever we were, six, seven, eight. But the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose on them and and shall by no means reduce it, mm. for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. Mm. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it. But your work will be not reduced by it. 
reduced in the least. Okay, now let's think about this before we get to the particular verse. You need to get straw for your brick. It's going to be obvious if there's not any straw in there. It's going to be obvious. It's going to crumble right away. They're going to know that it's not a well-made brick. Okay. Where are they going, without looking, where are they going to get straw? These are obviously not landowners. They've been, they, they're, they're servants. They may have a house, but they certainly don't have big property. It, it takes property to have straw. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You, you mow a field, you get straw. Well, these guys aren't going to have it. And even if they have it in their backyard and they cut the straw for the next day, right? How long does it take to grow more straw, especially in an arid place like Egypt? I, this is a real, real dilemma for these people. This is, you know, and why is he doing this? He said, because he wants them to not be idle. And they work seven days a week, every day of the year. There were no holidays, there were no vacations. This was, this was real tiresome work. And you know what, people lived, what, 35 years at the most? I mean, people back then, they carried these burdens until they couldn't carry them anymore, and then they just pushed them off the hill and let them rot. That, that this just this is the way of the world back then. You know they can. I'm sure they can prove all of this from archaeology. So anyway, go ahead. Here we're going to find out where they're going to get their straw from. Twelve. I don't know how to work this thing. Oh, I got something okay. going there. Twelve. Therefore they cry. Let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Oh, no, you passed that. That's, uh, I don't know where that is. Is that, that might be the next, uh, that might be 612. We're in uh, 512. I think he skipped a chapter when he hit that. We're in 512. 512. No, a little bit while you were gone. But we're on 512 now, but a, a button got pushed and we need to find 512. Okay, yeah, go ahead and read it while she's doing that. They're they're just going anywhere. It would be like us going out and you know on Midnight Pass Road or on Bee Ridge and just grabbing anything. Um, this is what they're doing because they don't have their own land. You just have to think what's going on in their situation. These poor people are desperate. So okay, go ahead. Thirteen. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, "Complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw." Hmm. The Israelite foreman appointed by Pharaoh's slave drivers were beaten and were asked. Why didn't you meet your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? It's like, hello, why didn't you? Yeah. So, yeah, once again, here's another thing. This is, this is just speculation. I have no idea what their workday was like, but I bet you they work from sun up to sundown. I, I, I will bet. So now, where are they going to find time to get straw? Unless they send their children and their wife and everybody else out to find this stuff. I mean, this is, this is a gigantic burden on the people. This isn't, and so you can understand, the reason why I'm bringing up all these little points as they come to mind is because when they complain, you can understand their position, okay? But, going back to what I said earlier, when they bowed their face and they worshiped the Lord, where is our faith in times of real trial? That is the whole point of what is being done here. Are you going to be faithful and say, he's God, he has got this under control, or are you going to say, you know, there was a mistake made here. You know, we can only look at things from our perspective. And here's an example I, I gave somebody just a day ago, is on the, the, the walk we have on uh, Saturday morning, Tom Alley and I, we go out to the uh, mission field and we go to the same people every week and we try to add in new people as they come along. But uh, there's this one girl that, uh, she's one of the few white people that lives in the projects. And uh, she's down there and you know, she lived with her mom who was a little bit nutty. Mom disappeared a couple months ago. She's got a boyfriend and uh, you know, it, it's kind of one of these drama type people. But, and she's not, it's not like she's a meth addict or anything. She's, she's a good looking girl. She's trying to get through nursing school. But you know, she, her life just is in a, a really bad place. But we walk up last week, last week, not yesterday, not Saturday, but a week ago, and she's just in tears on the porch, and there's a guy walking around the cell phone. And I thought, I just assumed it was her boyfriend because I, you know, I wasn't looking at him. And uh, I'm thinking, they just got in a big argument. You know, that's what I'm thinking. And how oh, the drama, you know. And we walk up, and her boyfriend had died minutes earlier in a car accident, oh. right? And uh, uh, this guy had just come by to help her out. And uh, so here we are, we're talking to her, and I thought, you know, she right now cannot see anything but her own misery. 
That's all that this girl can see. 